Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to Mass Effect. So, we have quite a few people we need to talk to. Commander, do you have a minute? I always make time for my officers. Off the record, I think there's something wrong here. This Serum is looking for records on some kind of galactic extinction. But we can't get back up from the council? Sorry, Commander. There's writing on the wall here, but someone isn't reading it. The council doesn't want to believe anything's wrong. I'd call it human nature, but... I hear you. It, it just seems like a group that's been around as long as the council should see this coming. It's funny, we finally get out here, and the final frontier was already settled. And the residents don't even seem impressed by the view. Or the dangers. Dreamalenko, secure man's future in space. <laughs> yeah, I, re I read a lot of those books when I was a kid. When the hero goes to space to prove himself worthy of a woman he loves, and, you know, for justice. Maybe I was a romantic in the beginning, but I thought about it after brain camp. Uh, I'm sorry, biotic acclimation and temperance training. I'm not looking for the dream. I just want to do some good. See what's out here. Sorry. I got too informed. Protocol wasn't a big focus back in Bot. Tell me about it. Biotic acclimation and temperance didn't last past the airlock. For the kids they hauled in was brain camp. Sorry, hauled in was unkind. We were encouraged to commit to an evaluation of our abilities so an understanding of biotics could be compiled. There are worse results of accidental exposure to element zero. Beats the brain tumor some kids grew up with. Is there some question about how you were exposed? My mother was downwind of a transport crash. It was before there were human biotics, a little after the discovery of the Martian ruins. It only gets iffy around 63 when Kinetics was running out of first gen subjects. Until then, they relied on accidentals. A bunch of guys in suit show up at your door after school. Next thing you know, you're out on Jump Zero. Jump Zero is Gagarin Station, right? What's it like? Yeah, that's the official name. Biggest and farthest facility we have for decades. Right on the termination shot. Outer edge of the solar system. It's where they did all the goose chase FTL research before we caught on to using mass effect fields. It was a sterile research platform when I was there. Jump Zero is Oops. Gagarin Station. Yeah, that's it. It's where they it was a sterile research platform. There were other kids in the same boat, right? At least you weren't alone out there. That's true. We did have a little circle and get together every night before lights out. We didn't have much to do, though. It was a research platform, and the Canadians kept Jump Zero off the extra net to prevent leaks. And you must have had plenty of time to get to know each other. Yeah. We'd sit around and bowl every night after dinner and play cards or network games. There was this girl named Rana, who had a little circle grow up around her. She was from Turkey, her family was very rich, but she was smart, and charming as hell. Beautiful, but not stuck up about it. Like you, I guess. Well... Sounds like she was special to you. She was. Maybe she felt the same, but things never fell together. Training. You know of any intentional exposures for certain? No one knows. Doesn't mean they didn't happen. As big as the exposures were, it was hard to track down accidentals. It was different than the ordinary potential, so there wasn't a lot of regulation. Anything Kinetics did was gold. I'm not saying they intentionally detonated drives over our outposts, but in retrospect, they were damn quick on the scene. Okay, we covered all that. Jump Zero is a long way from home. What was it like? The grand gateway to humanity looks a lot better in the bits. Anyway, this was supposed to be a casual debrief, not a full session about stuff that happened years ago. We have to depend on each other in combat. I like knowing what kind of man I have at my back. I understand, ma'am. I won't let you down. You, uh, 
make a habit of getting this personal with everyone? Of course. But I don't enjoy it with everyone. We'll talk again later. I'll, uh... I'll need some time to process that computer. But, yeah. I'd like that. I'll let him have it. Because I know what's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Your fate is sealed. Commander, are you coming to check up on me? You look much better. How are you feeling? Dr. Chakwas assures me I am going to be fine. I was impressed with her knowledge of Asari physiology. You're in good hands. Dr. Chakwas knows what she's doing. I never properly thanked you for saving me from the Geth, Commander. If you hadn't shown up, I... I'm just glad we got there in time. So am I. I know you took a chance bringing me aboard this ship. I have seen the way your crew looks at me. They do not trust me. But I am not like Benezia. I will do whatever I can to help you stop Saren. I promise. Don't worry, Liara. I trust you. I know you won't let me down. It means a lot to hear you say that, Commander. Thank you. Do you know why Benezia joined up with Saren? I don't understand it. She was always outspoken about the need for the Asari to become more involved in shaping galactic events. Maybe she thought aligning herself with Saren would somehow be for the greater good in the long run. At least I hope so. This hurts you, doesn't it? None of this makes any sense to me. I have not spoken to Benezia in many years, but I know her. And this was not like her. Something changed. I'd like to know more about the Asari. We were the first species to discover the Citadel. We were instrumental in forming the Council. And we always strive to be the voice of peaceful cooperation in galactic disputes. My people believe we are all part of a single galactic community. Each species contributes something to the greater whole. Although we seek to understand other species, it seems few of them seek to understand us. The galaxy is filled with rumors and misinformation about my people. Like what? Most of the inaccuracies are centered around our mating rituals. My species is monogendered. Male and female have no real meaning for us. We still require a partner to reproduce. This second parent, however, may be of any species and any gender. I don't understand. Your species can mate with anyone? Mating is not quite the proper term. Not as you understand it. Physical contact may or may not be involved, but it is not an essential element of the union. The true connection is mental. Our physiology allows us to meld with other beings. We can touch the very depths of their minds. We explore the genetic memory of their species. We share the most basic elements of their individual and racial identities. We then pass these traits onto our daughters. It is how we learn to grow as a species and how we develop a greater understanding of other races. What happens to your partner after the union? Every relationship is different. Some unions are a single encounter with both parents parting ways afterwards. Others can be more long term. Sometimes an Asari and her partner will stay together for many decades. You Asari live for a thousand years. What happens when your partner dies? Few sapient species live as long as my kind. We have learned to take a philosophical approach to our unions. We do not focus on the inevitable loss of our partners. Instead, we enjoy the time we spend with them. And even after they're gone, a part of them lives on in us. The union is a connection that transcends both time and space. Do you know who Matriarch Venezia chose as her partner? She rarely spoke of her partner. Though I know my father, if you want to use that term, was another Asari. Venezia never told you her partner's name? Union with our own kind is no longer common, not for the purposes of reproduction. Most Asari believe it weakens our species. Asari daughters inherit racial traits from the father species. If both parents are Asari, then nothing has been gained, or so conventional wisdom would hold. I am what is sometimes called a pure blood, though no Asari would ever be cruel enough to say the word to my face. It is a great insult among my people. 
It is possible Venezia's partner was embarrassed by their union. She may have been too ashamed to publicly acknowledge me as her offspring. Maybe she wanted to meet you but couldn't. If something could have happened to her. Maybe she passed away. You might be right. I hope you are. But I have no way to know for sure. Venezia never spoke of her partner. Whatever happened, it caused her too much pain to dwell on it. She raised me by herself, though that is not uncommon. Many Asari raise their children alone, particularly if the father species is short-lived. Often the partner will pass on long before the child reaches maturity. I should go. Goodbye, Commander. Yeah, I know there was one of those little conversation things that I missed, but... Eh. That takes care of those two. We'll go back down the elevator. I know, I didn't think about the elevator part until after I got up the elevator and closed up the game. I was like, you know, I really need to talk to everybody. And the best way to have done that would have been to stay down here. Crap. Commander, nice work out there. I knew working with the Spectre would be better than life at CSAC. Have you worked with the Spectre before? Well, no, but I know what they're like. Spectres make their own rules. You're free to handle things your way. But CSEC, you're buried by rules. The damn bureaucrats are always on your back. For the most part, the rules are there for a reason. Maybe. But sometimes it feels like the rules are only there to stop me from doing my work. If I'm trying to take down a suspect, it shouldn't matter how I do it, as long as I do it. But CSEC wants it done their way. Protocol and procedure come from that's why I left. So you just quit because you didn't like the way they do things? There's more to it than that. It didn't start out bad, but as I rose in ranks, I got saddled with more and more red tape. C-Sex handling of Saren was typical. I just couldn't take it anymore. I hate it. I hope you made the right choice. I'd hate for you to regret it later. Well, that's sort of why I teamed up with you. It's a chance for me to get off the Citadel. See how things are done outside CSEC. Either way, I plan to make the most of this. And without CSEC headquarters looking over my shoulder, well, maybe I can get the job done my way for a change. If getting the job done means endangering innocent people, then no. We get the job done right, not fast. Got it? I wasn't trying to. I understand, Commander. Oh, yeah. Shepard, what can I do for you? What's your story, Rex? There's no story. Go ask the Quarian if you want stories. You Krogans live for centuries. Don't tell me you haven't had a few interesting adventures. Well, there was this one time the Turians almost wiped out our entire race. That was fun. Yeah, they tried the same with us, but we fought them off. It's not the same. It seems pretty much the same to me. So your people were infected with a genetic mutation? An infection that makes only a few in a thousand children survive birth? And I suppose it's destroying your entire species? I suppose it isn't all the same. I don't expect you to understand. But don't compare humanity's fate with the Krogan. I was just making conversation. I wasn't trying to upset you. Your ignorance doesn't upset me, Shepard. As for the Krogan, I gave up on them long ago. The genophage infected us, but it's not what's killing us. Are you people really dying? We're sure not getting any stronger too spread out. None of us are interested in staying in our own system. Lots of species have left their homes and prospered. But they go to colonize new worlds. We're not settlers. We're warriors. We want to fight. So we leave. Hire ourselves out. And most of us never go back. What can you tell me about the genophage? 
Ask the Salarians if you want details. They made it. All I know, it makes breeding nearly impossible. Thousands die in stillbirth, and most never get that far. Every Krogan is infected, every one. And no one's rushing to find a cure. Why don't the Krogan try to find a cure? When was the last time you saw a Krogan scientist? You ask a Krogan, would he rather find a cure for the genophage or fight for credits? He'll choose fighting every time. It's just who we are, Shepard. I can't change that. Nobody can. So long, Rex. Shepard. Space racist. Commander? Do you have a few minutes to talk? One on one? Sure. I, I was hoping to get a minute of your time off the record. I keep an open door policy. If you have any concerns, lay them on me. All right. I, I know things are different aboard the Normandy, but uh, I'm I'm concerned about the aliens, Vicarian and Rex. With all due respect, Commander, should they have full access to the ship? You don't trust their motives because they're not human. This is the most advanced ship in the Alliance Navy. I don't think we should give them free reign to poke around the vital systems. Engines, sensors, weapons. You don't trust the Alliance's allies? I'm not sure I'd call the Council races allies. We, humanity, have to learn to rely on ourselves. How do you get from relying on ourselves to mistreating our allies? I don't mean we should mistreat them, Commander. I just think we should be prepared to go it without them. As noble as the council members seem now, if their backs are against the wall, they'll abandon us. You got a pessimistic view of the universe, Williams. A pessimist is what an optimist calls a realist. Look, if you're fighting a bear and the only way for you to survive is to sick your dog on it and run, you'll do it. As much as you love your dog, it isn't human. It's not racism, not really. Members of their species will always be more important to them than humans are. Right, so I'm going to take a quick little pause here to tell you guys something. Uh, Williams is wrong. Uh, I know several people who would willingly die for their dogs. Like, they would fight the bear. So, just put that out there, yeah, no, not always. But I guess that's how she was written, you know? They want her to be a racist. She's going to be a racist. These seem like deeply held beliefs, Williams. What made you think this way? My family's defended the Alliance since it was founded. My father, grandfather, great-grandmother, they all picked up a rifle and swore the oath of service. I guess we just tend to think of Earth's interests as our own. Doesn't sound like you've worked with aliens before. No, ma'am. Mainly I've been groundside, part of the surface garrison forces. I did get a rotation on a space station for training. Every Marine a rifleman, every rifleman ZG certified. That's odd. Your record is spotless and your technical scores are exemplary. You should be serving with the fleet. Anyway, that's why I haven't served with many aliens, Commander. You're lucky. I lost my family on Mindoir. Are you related to anyone I'd have heard of? Couldn't say, Commander. I read about Mandoir. The Alliance screwed the pooch in that one. Should have had a bigger garrison. Is that why you're out here? To take the fight to the pirates? No. The future of humanity is out here. There's so much we haven't seen yet. Yeah. I still remember my first field exercise on Titan. When we hit mud, the reality hit me. I'm the first person who ever stood here. Then my drill instructor kicked me in the ass. I went face first into the mug. He spent the next five minutes chewing me out for gold breaking. Don't tell me you had Gunny Ellison. He's the only one who uses that word to describe shirking duty. Oh lord. You went to the Makapag boot camp too? Yeah. Gunny Ellison's still reaming out recruits down there. Kicking ass and using words like inveigle and pusillanimous. <laughs> All right. I can see where your concerns are coming from, Williams, but this is a multilateral mission. You're gonna have to work with aliens, like it or not. It won't be a problem, Commander. You say jump, I say how high. 
You tell me to kiss a Turian, I'll ask which cheek. I don't think kissing Turians will be necessary. You never know, Commander. Dismissed, Chief. Ma'am. So I can always question her about the um, last missions. You can question them about how the last mission went and stuff like that. It's Hey, Commander, you know that Quarian Tally? She's been spending all her time down here asking me about our engines. It's kind of an ongoing thing. It's really not important. I'll tell her to leave you alone. What? No, she's amazing. I wish my guys were half as smart as she is. Give her a month on board and she'll know more about our engines than I do. She's got a real knack for technology, that one. I can see why you wanted her to come along. I figured she'd be a real asset to the team. You've got an eye for talent, Commander. But I'm guessing that's not why you came down here. Fill me in on the IES stealth system. How does it work exactly? You can't hide a ship out in space. They emit too much heat and radiation. Too easy for sensors to pick them up. Unless you find a way to capture those emissions. So our stealth systems trap the energy we give off in storage sinks built into the ship itself, with no emissions to give away our location. Eventually the sinks have to be vented. More than a few hours silent running and they overheat. Cook us inside our own hull. There's no way for anyone to detect us? A visual scan can still pick us up. Anyone looking out a window can see us plain as day. But you have to be pretty close to get an actual visual out in space. Most vessels rely on scanners. As long as the stealth systems are engaged, they can't see us. Not unless we accelerate to FTL speeds. Why doesn't it work with faster than light travel? Cranking up the FTL, blue shifts our emissions, pushes them into frequencies too high to capture in the sinks. As soon as we make the jump, it's like setting off a flare. Sensors can pick up our location whenever we enter or exit FTL flight, but for short-range missions, our stealth systems are amazing, and we've got the only one. I want to know more about the Normandy. She's the best ship I've ever served on, probably the fastest vessel ever designed. She's the only one using the new Tantalus Drive Core. What's so special about the Tantalus Drive Core? Proportionally, it's about twice the size of any other vessel. Not only are we faster, but we can run at FTL speeds longer before we have to discharge the core. Where else have you served, Adams? You name a class of Alliance ship, I probably served on it. Everything from dreadnoughts and carriers right down to frigates like the Normandy. My last assignment was on the Tokyo. Only a cruiser, but she was a good ship. Couldn't hold a candle to the Normandy, though. Carry on, Adams. Aye, aye. Uh, I will also be taking care of the uh, Earth mission in this one, too. Your ship's amazing, Shepard. I've never seen a drive cord like this before. I can't believe you were able to fit it into a ship this small. I'm starting to understand why you humans have been so successful. I had no idea Alliance vessels were so advanced. The Normandy's a prototype, cutting-edge technology. A month ago, I was patching a makeshift fuel line into a converted tug ship in the flotilla. Now. I'm sitting on board one of the most advanced vessels in Citadel space. I have to thank you again for bringing me along. Traveling on a vessel like this is a dream come true for me. I had no idea you found ship technology so interesting. It comes with being a Quarian. The migrant fleet is the key to the survival of my people. Ships are our most valuable resource. But we don't have anything like this. We make do with cast-offs and second-hand equipment. We just try to keep them running for as long as we can. Some of the fleet's larger vessels date all the way back to our original flight from the Geth. I can't believe your fleet's still using ships that are three centuries old. They're constantly being repaired, modified, and refitted. They aren't pretty, but they work. Mostly. We've tried to make ourselves as independent as possible on the flotilla. Grow our own food, mine, and process our own fuel. But some things we just can't make on our own. A patch to maintain the hull integrity requires raw materials we just don't have. That's why our pilgrimages are so important. I want to know more about the pilgrimage. When my people reach maturity, we leave our birth ships and seek acceptance with a new crew. It's necessary to maintain genetic diversity among the fleet. But no ship wants to accept someone who will be a burden on them. So, to prove our worth, we embark on a pilgrimage. 
We set out alone, leaving the flotilla and our families behind us. We only return once we have found something of value we can bring back to the fleet. This is presented as a gift to the captain of the respective ship we wish to join. If the gift is accepted, we are welcomed into the crew. Yeah. Sounds a lot like the Amish. You know, only a lot more dangerous and, you know, well, yeah, a lot more dangerous, really. Can a captain choose to reject the gift? Uh, that doesn't happen often. Most captains are eager to increase the size of their crew. It increases their own standing in our society. Even when a gift is not particularly valuable, the captain usually accepts it out of a sense of tradition. However, there is a stigma to presenting a substandard gift. It's not the best way to make a good impression on a new community. Most pilgrims don't return until they find something worthwhile. I can't believe they just send you off alone. It's not like they just cast us out. Before we leave, we are given lessons in how to survive outside the flotilla, and given gifts to help us on our journey. We also receive implants to fight off sickness and disease. Generations of living in an isolated and highly controlled environment have left our immune systems weaker than most. By the time we leave the fleet, we are well equipped for the pilgrimage. This is a rite of passage for all Quarians. If it were dangerous, our numbers would suffer. Virtually every pilgrimage ends with a triumphant return and the ritual presentation of the gift to one of the fleet's captains. I want to talk about something else. Like what? Tell me about your people. Our lives aren't easy. Resources are scarce, and we are constantly on the move. Everything we do must in some way contribute to the continuation of the migrant fleet. There are 17 million Quarians in the flotilla, and each of us relies on the others for survival. The bonds among my people are strong. Unfortunately, we have had to surrender many of the freedoms and civil liberties other species take for granted. What kind of freedoms? Well, it's illegal for parents to have more than one child. If our population grows too much, it would strain our resources to their breaking. Of course, we also can't allow our numbers to become too few. If our population is in decline, the rule against single births is temporarily repealed. In extreme cases of population decline, incentives are even offered to encourage multiple births. Though the Conclave hasn't had to take such measures in nearly a century. That's your government. The Conclave is our civilian branch of government. Each ship can elect a representative to serve on the Conclave and make decisions that affect the fleet as a whole. On matters that affect an individual ship, however, the captain has the final say. It's a tradition that dates back to the early days, when the fleet was governed by martial law. Fortunately, most captains nowadays are smart enough to have an elected council from their crew to give them advice and guidance. So the ultimate power rests with elected officials? In practice, the Conclave and the respective council for each ship tend to set the rules that govern our daily lives. But in theory, we are still under military jurisdiction. The five top-ranking military officials in the fleet serve on the Admiralty Board. These five have the power to overrule any decision by the Conclave in case of emergency. To do so requires unanimous agreement among the Admiralty. And they can only do this once. After that, the entire board must resign their posts. It's a safeguard that served us well. In nearly three centuries, the Admiralty Board has only overruled the Conclave four times. I want to know more about the Geth. I doubt I can tell you anything you don't already know. It's been almost three centuries since they drove my people into exile. All I know is the story of their origins. What they were when we created them and how they turned on us. Interesting. The Geth were originally created to serve as an automated manual labor force. Initially, their intelligence was as limited as any PI. Over time, we made small modifications to their programming to allow them to perform more varied and complex tasks, bringing them closer and closer to true AI status. 
come the council didn't step in and stop you? This wasn't true AI research. We may have been skirting the bounds of the law, but we never did anything that was actually illegal. The changes were so insignificant, so gradual, that we were able to control them. Or so we thought. But one thing we underestimated was the power of the neural network. A million Geth thinking simultaneously created an inherently unstable matrix. What made them rebel? As we built more and more Geth, their effective intelligence became more sophisticated, more abstract. One day, a Geth began to ask its Quarian overseer questions about the nature of its existence. Am I alive? Why am I here? What is my purpose? As you can imagine, this caused a near panic among my people. What did you do? It was inevitable the newly sentient Geth would rebel against their situation. We knew they would rise up against us, so we acted first. A general order went out across all Quarian-controlled systems to permanently deactivate all Geth. The Geth responded to this order violently. Hey, you can't blame them for fighting for their survival. We had no other choice. The Geth were already on the verge of revolution. By acting quickly, we had a chance to end the war before it began. The hope was that most of the Geth would still be little more than machines, incapable of organized resistance. But they had progressed much further than anyone anticipated. The war was long and bloody. Millions upon millions of Quarians died at their hands. In the end, we were forced to flee our own homeworld. We feared the Geth would pursue us, but they never came beyond the Veil. Now, we drift through space, exiled, searching for a way to reclaim what was once ours. <laughs> yeah, so we've already heard that one, and I'm not going to do that one, although, you know, we'll get into this later on. I should go. See you later. <laughs> yeah, I have a few viewpoints on the whole Geth Quarian situation. But fortunately for me, all of those viewpoints are sort of justified in later versions of the game. So we'll take care of the mission out at 